Hello, friends. Uh, thanks for listening in. We are coming to you from beautiful Colombo, Sri Lanka. From my point of view, it's always good to be here because it's a great cricketing country and uh, we're a thick and cricket season in many parts of the world. More importantly, the hotel is situated beautifully here by the ocean and we look out of our windows every morning. It's a bright, beautiful day to see all that uh, uh, sight in front of you and the Air Force base are not far from here. The cadets are running and working out and so on. But that's not why we're here. We're actually here to do a pastors conference in Asia, one of the first that RZIM has ever done. And uh, it's been splendid. We've had about 240 from various Asian countries. And for me personally, it's a thrill to have had the lineup of speakers. My good friend Louis Giglio, I'll be talking to him briefly on it. And then we have Edmund Chan from Singapore, Jeff Vines from Los Angeles, my own teammates and Abdu and Max Jaganathan and so on. So it's been quite, you know, I sat there this morning and thought, what a feast listening to messages like this. And so, Louis, you know, uh, you, of course, stay busy on the road, busy as a pastor. You probably are more experienced to talk about these than we are. Well, what's your take on uh, how you feel they were receiving the message and what, what about some of the interaction you've had? Yeah, I think that just being in this space with you and with the team has been so inspiring for me. Uh, American Christianity is its own species. And there's so much to love about it and so much to lack about it. And I think uh, I was just saying to my colleague uh, after we arrived in Dubai and then came here onto Colombo that everyone in our church needs to spend time in this part of the world. Uh, once you come to Asia, to India, to Pakistan, to Saudi Arabia, to Colombo, Sri Lanka, your perspective shifts completely and totally. It's different than taking a vacation to London or Paris, although that's helpful. <laughs> it's a whole new mindset and a whole new way of life. And so already for me, it's challenging me to the core values of my faith and at the same time uh, lifting me up with the encouragement of what God is doing around the world. Exactly. On every continent, in every nation, in every culture, in every language, Jesus is doing that thing that he promised to do, which is building his church and to meet brothers and sisters that now in a very uh, microcosmic world, we all know each other even though we've never met. And so to meet so many people today who say, I have come to your church or I saw Passion Conference or I've listened to a message and that's the beauty of this microcosmic world that we're all united now and we can now be in one space face to face celebrating the same message, the same gospel, the same power that has raised us all from death to life. And to do it here with, in Sri Lanka, which I would just say after my first visit here, Ravi, probably the sweetest people yeah. I've ever been around right. in this nation. Um, it's been a real treasure. So thank you for the invitation. Well, yeah, I can't tell you how grateful we are that you accepted it, Louis, because I know I'm an itinerant, you know? I know being away from home is a sacrifice, but you so readily accepted it. And I was just thinking truly as you were speaking, what a blessing it was for them to be hearing you, you know, you, your own story was amazing, is amazing, and these young pastors especially would have been greatly blessed by that. I talked to pastors from Pakistan, you know, and coming from India, there are tensions between India and Pakistan, and yet here we are, you know, having the Pakistani friends inviting us to come there and minister in parts of India that are more oppressed yeah. when they believe in Christ. So uh, I agree with you, it's, it's uh, you grow, you know, you're not the same person when you leave. Uh, Abdu, you spoke that today as well, what was your theme? I know you were speaking on, uh, was it honor and uh, honor shame? And shame. Issue? Yeah. yeah, which is one of the chapters right. in the book is uh, the, the honor and shame mentality and how can you actually preach the gospel in a culture where that is obsessed with obtaining honor and obsessed with avoiding shame. Uh, you know, and the gospel has this uh, connotation of being Western, of being guilt and innocence oriented, you know, the atonement where the guilt of our, uh, our guilt was fastened on Jesus and because he is declared innocent, we are imputed that innocence and look like him and all these kind of things. And that's, I think, uh, misunderstood to be a Western idea. When you look at the, the, the Bible, it actually says so much about honor and shame. Jesus was a Middle Easterner. He was an Easterner. He understood 
the, the, the impetus to want to obtain honor and the desire to want to avoid shame, uh, yet he also speaks to the person who is thinking about their own guilt and their desire to be cleaned and innocent and all these things, which is why, you know, in Psalm 25, when, when the David talks about the, the shame that is being removed, but also the innocence and not being judged because of his guilt, he bridges both. And the, the Bible, I think, uniquely does that. It bridges an Eastern mentality and a Western mentality, because I'm convinced more and more, the more I'm here and the more I'm in the West, I'm convinced they look so similar. We have this phrase, as far as the East is from the West, but they're not that far apart when it comes down to it, are they? Well, and you know, uh, I have to, what was the message, received well? I think so, yeah. Good. Okay. yeah. We chatted with them afterwards. Quite a bit, quite a bit. Yeah, I was away after that. I'm sorry to have missed it. Uh, my reaction, Louis, today as I was hearing you was, because I've lived in the West long enough now, so I'm accustomed much more to how a Western minister would communicate. But your transparency was profoundly moving, you know, uh, the, the human side of our lives is uh, so ridiculously forgotten by listeners, you know. They think because you're a teacher, or you're a leader, you don't go through the valley, you don't go through the dark uh, nights of the soul. Uh, I have to say to you personally, your story profoundly moved me. That's the first time I've actually heard it from you directly. Uh, did, uh, did you get some feedback from them individually? Uh, I uh, have gotten some feedback, uh, some some very disturbing uh, from the uh, cultures yeah. of people saying I went through a similar time. I was talking obviously about depression and anxiety and yeah. some of the struggles that I've been through in my own life. And one young pastor said I was at that point in my life and I didn't have anyone to talk to because in some of these cultures, Abdul, mm -hmm. you know, admitting weakness is the last thing that any man is going to do. Oh, yeah. Certainly a pastor, a spiritual leader. And I think the same is true even in the West. You know, we have these personas of, I'm the man of God. <laughs> and uh, the man of God should have it all together. Right. But I'm pretty confident I'm sitting at a table of three men, none of whom have it all together. And I know this by personal experience. And so I speak from the leverage of my own life. I yeah. know my struggles. Mm -hmm. And I assume that everybody else who's flesh and blood has those same struggles. And what I saw in the room tonight uh, today uh, was uh, a receptivity but then my heart was broken when this young pastor said I finally was able to call out to my dad and say dad I'm going through this particular situation I need mm. help and his mm. dad's answer was snap out of it yep. Yep. and so yeah. you know that broke my heart but it was encouraging to know that the message resonates yeah. and I said a line today and I think you amen so we got an email from Ravi Zacharias. That's a pretty big deal. <laughs> the score. And um, what I said was the human heart is the same everywhere around the world. Mm -hmm. And so I've tried in my life, Ravi, to minimize the cultural differences and to maximize the human consistencies, mm -hmm. to minimize what culture says and to maximize the fact that we're all the same all created in God's image. Therefore, all our struggles, honestly, are the same. Mm. And you know, uh, as you're listening in, this is uh, a very important type of conference to have because those in ministry get quite lonely. They do not know where to turn. They don't know where to go. And amongst the differences between East and West that are still palpable, it's the fact that uh, leadership in the East does not know where to turn for help because it is the honor and shame thing mm -hmm. that comes into it. And so for to stand before these 240 pastors and for those who have supported it and made it possible, thank you very much. And they come and thank us for it. Uh, I think it is going to be the beginning of a lot of pastors conferences that we're going to do. And I think with that as a bridge, Louis, you know how the Lord weaves the fabric of our lives, we get more surprised each time, but I don't know why. Uh, the book that is so beautifully endorsed for us, which I appreciate, called Seeing Jesus from the East, was actually originally the idea of Nabil Qureshi, who passed away a couple of years ago in his early 30s. Nabil said to me, you know, I come from Pakistan, Muslim background, you come from India, we've had our tensions, your ancestors were Hindus. I'd love for us to have two window approaches to looking at Jesus. 
and uh, of course shortly thereafter he was diagnosed with cancer of the fourth stage which was a shocker and Nabil attended your church yeah. and more than that Nabil met Michelle at a passion conference yeah. and uh, they were uh, wed after that so there's a connection here and when Nabil passed away you know he, he had wanted this book to be written I thought of no better person to talk to than my colleague Abdu because Abdu comes from Lebanon from an uh, Islamic background and uh, the, the twin realities with Abdu are not only does he understand Jesus for three Eastern eyes, but he does the hard work. You know, I, 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 do, I do my writing and a lot of work to be done after that and he pulls it all together. Uh, comment on the, on, the, on the benefit of reading this book to the listeners. Mm. Well, it was, it was an honor when you called me to ask me uh, to be a part of this project. I knew that it was something dear to Nabil as well. And the first thing I did, I, th I hope this was an Eastern thing to do. I didn't need permission legally. I didn't need permission even conceptually, but I wanted that permission and that blessing from Michelle. Wow. Uh, and I called her immediately. I was at an wow. airport uh, yeah. lounge when you called and I called her immediately said, um, uh, Raviji just asked me to be a part of this. Um, I want to make sure you're okay with it. And she was delighted and we could do something together. She maintains closeness with the ministry. Um, I think that is sort of encapsulating what this book is all about. It takes that which is Western. Michelle is Western, but she was married to an Easterner and she understood that. It takes that which is Eastern, the honoring of people's wishes, the honoring of their, 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 their heritage and the, and, the, and the connections they make, that we're not all islands. We are all connected in some way and every action does that. So it was my honor to be a part of this project uh, seeing it from my own perspectives, the chapters I wrote on honor and shame, the blessings of persecution and the blessings of sacrifice. And of course, the, the chapter that I really thought about hard was why Westerners should care how Easterners see Jesus. And for me, it was a true delight to see Jesus was a traditionalist. He loved tradition. He understood tradition. He upheld tradition until it violated the individual. And then he stood against tradition until it, and, uh, when it violated the individual. And so individuality is a seriously Western virtue, and it's a good one. When it's taken too far, it forsakes the collective. Jesus honored the individual, but he also honored the collective at the same time. And I just saw that, and it was the blessing for me was I got to see him through Eastern eyes afresh once again. And I hope that people who read this, who are from the West, will see that he's not this sort of imperialistic god of the westerners to control brown people and women and from the east they'd see that he's not this western god he is the god who bridges both well you know i of course till my 20th year of life was raised in the east in many ways i'm still quite eastern you know mm. and my margie my wife for 47 years from canada when we go to India, she'll always, after a little while, start looking strangely at me, you know, she'll say, boy, you're sounding more Indian by the day, you know, uh, the way you speak changes because you're adjusting your intonation for them and so on. I've loved the life that God has given to me, uh, being raised in the East and now living in the West. I wouldn't trade where I'm living for anywhere else now. Living in Atlanta, Georgia is a wonderful place to live. But uh, one of the chapters I wrote was in the chapter of uh, uh, weddings and temples. Mm -hmm. I mean, I crashed many a wedding growing up. <laughs> uh, we'd be playing cricket, and all of a sudden you'd see this uh, groom's party, or he'd be on a horse, and about 200 people following him, and a band that was sounded more like it was practicing than playing would be a couple of them, you know, and we uh, And you thought we, free food. That's right, that's exactly <laughs> right. And every time I came back home a little late and said I wasn't going to have dinner, my mother said, have you been to a wedding again? <laughs> you know, when you see a wedding invitation in the East, it's we invite you along with your family and friends. That's mm -hmm. the way it read, you know. So you could we'll expect, see yeah, 1,000 to 2,000 people, uh, not uncommon. So and it would be in a tent. So we just walk in, have some tandoori chicken and some biryani and all of that. <laughs> and so you think of Jesus as parable, you know, mm -hmm. going out into the highways, inviting yeah. them over to the banquet, total strangers. So I hope this book does something. Uh, that, that, that's one thing I want to say about West being living in the West. It's wonderful to see how open the West really is. Mm. You know, where they're willing to learn, they're willing to understand, and they want to uh, just get a glimpse of this. 
So, Louis, your endorsement was important. I know you've written on the life of our Lord in beautiful ways. Uh, thanks for doing that. Your comment as you travel east and west and think of how you present the gospel in the in these two parts of the world. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to say thank you for the book to both of you. And I just, I love the snapshot of this moment yeah. where we have a Lebanese mm -hmm. Indian yeah. born in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> um, so we're representing, you know, all parts yeah. of the world mm. together. Yeah. And I feel like just speaking up for the people of America, right. uh, there is um, such a stereotypical view of people yeah. from the East. Mm. And obviously the headlines play into that in our modern world. And if you see an Arabic person on the street in a given city, you immediately think certain things because of the headline, the storylines of our world. And I just implore people mm -hmm. to travel the world or in the case of Atlanta, just travel across the city. Mm -hmm. right. There's a lots of Easterners living in Atlanta, Georgia, mm -hmm. and meet someone, and a lot of us are doing this, but I want to encourage it more and more. Mm -hmm. Build a relationship, invite a friend to dinner, start a conversation, ask questions, seek to understand, and you'll find that we have more in common than we have different. And Jesus isn't from the Middle West. He's not from Iowa. <laughs> He's from Israel and Palestine. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage people to read the book and to take the, the journey to Israel. Take the journey to Palestine. Not just the tourist side, meet the people. Mm. Build friendships and relationships because the world's getting smaller and smaller. Mm. And I don't find it difficult and I never stress, Ravi, when I travel culture to culture to culture. I always seek to learn. So when I arrived in Colombo, I wanted to know everything I could know about Sri Lanka. We arrived here on Independence Day. It was a good day to learn about the country. <laughs> but I, when you begin to preach the gospel and you preach grace and you preach mercy, this message is a radical message everywhere in the world, not just in the West. <laughs> People are as religious in the West as they are in the East. Mm -hmm. Grace and mercy is a radical concept, and I believe it touches the lives of people everywhere. So what I've learned, short end of the question, Jesus is the most relevant message in the world. Mm -hmm. If you preach who he is and what he has done for us and mm -hmm. get past the name, and tell his story. And so I've sought to do that in every culture, and I think people in every culture have that innate desire to know a God of grace and a God of mercy, and I've seen people respond to that message everywhere it is proclaimed, because that's what he promised in Acts chapter one. This gospel will be preached here in Jerusalem, in Samaria, in Judea, and to the ends of the earth. So he knew the message would win. Mm. everywhere it was preached. Mm. Well, and I think uh, as I close, I want to say one of the things that appealed so much this morning as you were speaking was your story. You know, that communicates all over the globe. And Jesus was the greatest storyteller, the teller of parables. Uh, Abdu and uh, Nabil had one thing in common, that they were both critics of Christianity before they came to Christ. Both were skeptical of Christianity, challenged its fundamental ideas. Nabil was studying to prove it wrong, and Abdu, Abdu was doing the same thing, and then rescued by the message of Jesus Christ. So I think when you read this book, folks, uh, I hope uh, you will truly be blessed and transformed, because it's a story from creation to the consummation to which God calls all of us. It's been wonderful to be doing some filming in Colombo for this and wonderful to be with my colleagues. So uh, God bless you and uh, enjoy the book, enjoy the story afresh through Eastern eyes and find out how relevant it is both transtemporally, transcontinentally, transculturally and so individually true for each one of us because it is objectively true in the revelation of history. Thank you gentlemen, Thank great you, to be with both of you. you. God bless you folks.